So I, I wanted to um, pick up on Francis's metaphor when he was sharing with us about the breakthrough phase, the metaphor of, of the mountain, of um, climbing to the top of the mountain. In this case, I want to talk about returning from the mountaintop. And I love, I love this uh, mountain metaphor. It's such a beautiful um, metaphor because I think it speaks to something deep in us as human beings. It's a, na it's a nature metaphor. And for me, I grew up in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, when I left, I went and moved to the Rocky Mountains. I've always lived near mountains. And I learned recently that the mountains I grew up in are over a billion years old. They're one of the 10 oldest mountain ranges in the world. They're so old that they're actually dying. They're actually on the descent. They're not rising anymore. They're falling. So even mountains arise and pass away. Just over a little bit longer time scale than we do. And if you look at the mountain metaphor and the journey that we've been taking so far, the journey has been to go up to the top of the mountain, the peak, where we have that amazing vantage point, that clear view, where it seems like we are the, the transcendent witness, the one who is aware of everything, all the valleys, all the sky, the clouds, the plains stretching out toward infinity. And then as we go down the mountain and our knees start to ache and the clouds come in and it starts to rain and it gets muddy and we get scared. Oh my gosh, will I be able to make it down? This is terrifying. I'm never going to go hiking again. It's like we suddenly forget <laughs> of how beautiful it was. And we're slipping down in the mud, um, cursing, going, what the fuck did I get myself into? Um, and then at some point, it starts to level out a little bit. And we start to realize we're going to make it. <laughs> it's going to be okay. This is like the equanimity phase. When we start to gain uh, our sense of familiar ground, um, but it's different now in a way. It's more groundless because we've been transformed by the journey we've been on. And for me, the completion phase is like coming back down to the bottom of the mountain, returning back to where we started, but returning from a new, from a new place. As T.S. Eliot put it, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know that place for the first time. So this is a metaphor for completion, for awakening. It's not actually that we've gotten anywhere. And yet the process, the journey of seeking, of effort, of breakthrough, of disillusionment, equanimity, that entire journey, the arc of it, has transformed us. In the tradition that I've trained in, in the Buddhist tradition in general, they refer to this moment of returning, of completion, as nirvana. It literally means to blow out a candle. What is nirvana? One of my teachers, teachers, Bill Hamilton, he said, nirvana is an experience of the unconditioned, which defies any description. Any description of nirvana is not a description of nirvana. And that is the most that can be said about nirvana. There are no reference points in nirvana on which to base a description. So what I'm saying is that awakening is not an experience. And yet it is something that transforms our relationship to experience. It transforms our very notion of who we are, of who is it that is on this journey, and what is the journey, if not to come back and to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time.
all of the seeking, all of the looking, all of the yearning and wanting for something else obscures our perception of what's right here, right in front of us. So simple, it's not easy to see. The founder of Zen in Chan in China, Bodhidharma, he said this about Nirvana. He said, when the mind reaches Nirvana, you don't see Nirvana because the mind is Nirvana. If you see Nirvana somewhere outside the mind, you're deluding yourself. Very similar echo of, of what Bill said. No reference points on which to base a description. If you see it outside the mind, you're deluding yourself. So this journey of completion, of coming back, is, is like full circle. It's like returning back to where we are. In the Zen tradition, they have this beautiful image of what they call the Enso in Japanese calligraphy. And the Enso is just the single movement, the single stroke, sometimes it's two strokes, where you're doing the circle and it comes back all the way around. And then it doesn't quite complete, it's not a circle but it comes back, it almost completes. So to me, this, this is another great visual analogy for what this process of completion is like. We come back to where we are. You're coming back now to your life as it is, leaving this retreat, leaving the journey. And yet your life isn't going to be exactly the same because you're not exactly the same. And this experience of nirvana is the experience of not finding anything and not being disappointed about that. It's actually a relief. It's like, oh, this is it. As Tolku Ergen Rinpoche said, in the not finding is the finding. So this is paradoxical. We think we're going to find something, but we don't. But in not finding anything, we realize, oh, that's it. And what's interesting about completion is that completion is both an end and it's also a beginning in the same way that as we come full circle, we start a new circle, or you could say we start a new process. The phases of insight, like the phases of the moon. This is from our teacher, Trudy Goodman. She said, can we appreciate all of the phases of the moon, all the stages of our life? Can we see past the patterns of perception that too often eclipse the wonder of being alive? The lunar phases of birth, growth, fullness, then letting go little by little and vanishing into the mysterious darkness. These are the eternal cycles of all life. So part of what we're waking up to are the cycles of life, to the seasons, to the change that has a particular quality of repeating, of cycling, of recursing. We could think of awakening not just as a linear process of going through stages, but also a recursive process, a process of looping, of self-similar patterns emerging again and again. There's a recursive joke. In order to understand recursion, you must understand recursion. And if you're like me and spent, I spent about five minutes reading that again and again until I finally got it. I was like, oh, what? Oh, I'm doing it. That's recursion. On this path, we don't just end with completion. Completion marks the beginning of the next cycle, seeking again.
Or as John Verveke in his, in his YouTube series, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis says, evolution is revolution with change. Revolving with change. So it's not just that this process continues, but it does. It continues, it deepens, and changes and evolves. This constant cycling, there's a changing that's happening along with it. So you could say, in fact, that we are not coming full circle with awakening, but that the awakening process is coming full spiral. That we're not just circling, we're spiraling. And in that spiraling, there is a deeper pattern of unfolding, of growth and development, of evolution that starts to unfold as we begin to learn these lessons again and again at different deeper levels, in different contexts, with more and more of reality becoming included in the process of awakening. And one thing I really appreciate about this way of looking at the path of seeing that awakening is not just this one time event that occurs and then you're done. As one teacher said, there is no enlightened retirement. <laughs> this is a process that continues. Is that means that there are actually many paths up the mountain. So we, we, it's not like we stop going up the mountain. We go back the next day and say, okay, now am I going to go up the same way and familiarize myself with this practice, this path, or am I going to find another way up the mountain? And here I extend the analogy because this is such a beautiful analogy. Often when this analogy is used, we're always talking about the top of the mountain, but what about the path or the paths? In my experience, there isn't just one path up this mountain. This mountain is vast beyond comprehension. This, this, there are as, number, as many number of paths up this mountain are, as there are sentient beings. Beings are numberless, they say in Zen. Dharma gates are infinite. Another Zen saying, I vow to enter them all. So one thing that can happen upon arriving where we began is that we can see an opportunity to go on the journey again in a new way, to discover new things. Jack Kornfield, in an article called Enlightenment, he talks about it this way. He says, we know that the Buddha taught many different approaches to enlightenment all a skillful means to release grasping of the limited sense of self and return to the inherent purity of consciousness. Similarly, we will discover that the teachings on enlightened consciousness include many dimensions. When you actually experience consciousness free of identification with changing conditions, liberated from greed and hate, you find it multifaceted, like a mandala or a jewel, a crystal with many sides. Through one facet, the enlightened heart shines as luminous clarity, through another as perfect peace, through another as boundless compassion. Consciousness is timeless, ever-present, completely empty, and full of all things. But when a teacher or tradition emphasizes only one of these qualities over the others, it's easy to be confused, as if true enlightenment can be tasted in only one way. Like the particle and wave nature of light, enlightenment, enlightened consciousness is experienced in a myriad of beautiful ways. So what I would suggest is that as we mature and grow up through our awakening process, we start to see that awakening isn't just one thing, it's many things. And it's also one thing. For me, as my process of awakening has unfolded, I've had some moments where I really thought I got this, where I came to a really powerful completion 
where for several months or maybe even a year or so after, I really wasn't sure if there was anything else I needed to do. After one of these experiences about 10 years ago, I started to find that a new journey began and it wasn't one I expected at all. It was a journey into the body. I had really awakened at the level of the mind primarily. And it's, it's a valid way to awaken, but I hadn't learned how to include my entire being in that awakened consciousness. It was like just from the neck up. <laughs> One of the teachers that I ended up studying their work and finding quite helpful, Reggie Ray, in his book, Touching Enlightenment, he said, to be awake, to be enlightened, is to be fully and completely embodied. To be fully embodied means to be one with who you are in every respect including our physical being, our emotions, and the totality of our karmic situation, all of the causes and conditions which have led to us. It is to be entirely present to who we are and to the journey of our own becoming. It is to inhabit completely our relative reality with no speck of ourselves left over, no external observer waiting for something else or something better. So the process of enlightenment, the, the journey of completion is truly about including more of who we are in this awareness. For there to be nothing left out, nothing external. And not just nothing in external in our own experience, but nothing external in the world, in the universe. This process for me more and more is not an individual journey, even though that's how it began for me. Rather, it is very much a collective process of awakening. And I, I suspect all of you have had, in your own ways, taste of this as we've practiced together, as we've noted out loud, as we've shared spontaneous gratitude with each other, as we've really used each other's presence to help develop our own wakefulness. We're in this process together. If someone's pain arises and we're practicing together, all of us feel it. We have to address it, we have to respond, we have to learn how to respond with loving awareness. That's what awakening is. Injustice anywhere, Martin Luther King, that same quote that Emily shared at the very beginning of this retreat, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So for me, this process of awakening, while it can be very individually focused, they're not always. It really must become a collective process as well for it to be complete. Because we cannot be free if all of us aren't free. And this is a really important time to be reminded of that. Um, and I'm really grateful for being reminded of that on this retreat. So as we enter into the world, as we re-enter where we always have already been, but we re-enter now with some kind of transformation in our understanding of consciousness, of our own awareness, of our connection to each other, as we've worked through and um, started to tenderize the heart, um, we have this beautiful opportunity to have a little bit extra space in how we relate to things and others. We have an opportunity to um, meet the moment with a little bit more 
acceptance to um, hopefully do a little bit better than, than we thought maybe was possible. And of course, that won't always be the case. We're still going to you know, have bad days and you know, the high of the retreat will fade and maybe in a few days you'll be in an argument with someone and be like, where did all my open-hearted concentration go? But still, it, don't, don't forget, even in those moments, that no, what, what we've done here, the, the work of expanding the heart, of opening, of developing presence, like it, you can go back to your original shape and form. It's just not possible. This is a process of transformation. <laughs>